we've put in place uh, comprehensive support measures for our customers, as has the broader industry, which I think is going to help the, support the economy through a very difficult time. As you said, as part of our quarterly result, one of the things we need to do is look forward and see what we expect our loan losses to be. And because of the significant economic impact from the coronavirus, that's seen us update our provisions for future loan losses by $1.5 billion, as you said, taking our total provisions to be $6.4 billion for future credit losses, which of course has had quite a big impact on the profit number for this quarter. Yeah. Operationally, though, this quarter, uh, I mean, home lending growth and um, household deposits were above system. Business lending grew. Uh, were you pleased with that? And what's happening April into May? Yeah, very pleased with the operational performance. I, I think the team have done a fantastic job serving our customers through a, a challenging period. We had a strong first half to 31 December. We saw some of that momentum really follow into this year, as you said. Specifically, what we've seen actually in, in April, again, another strong month uh, in deposits and actually volumes in and around home lending, which is a little surprising, remain quite robust actually in, in May up year on year. Now, May last year wasn't a particularly busy month. It was in the lead up to the federal election, as you would recall. Mm. But what we've seen is uh, customer activity, particularly switching into fixed rates and some refinance from other institutions. And so volume certainly uh, more robust than we would have expected, although we do anticipate that the housing market will uh, ease over the course of the calendar year. Well, indeed, Matt, I mean, a lot of focus on the housing market, of course, and your two scenarios you put forward, specifically your prolonged downside scenario, uh, which admittedly is exactly that, but uh, the possibility of a 32% uh, fall in the property market. Now, that, that assumes uh, some fairly tough, uh, tough numbers around GDP and a long, long time for a recovery. Yes, that's right. I mean, we're very supportive of the federal government's approach to restarting the economy and it's possible that both of our scenarios are, are more negative than what actually unfolds and we hope they are. But yeah. it's prudent from a bank perspective to consider uh, more significant downturns in the context of our provisioning and so we used some of the Reserve Bank's economic data and forecasts from last Friday and then created a more uh, significant downturn which of course we're going to do what we can to try to avoid but if we do see a prolonged economic downturn then of course the impacts on both GDP, unemployment, uh, income and ultimately through to multiple asset classes mm. including housing uh, could be quite damaging. I think your own economists are calling a 10% drop in, in pricing in six months. I mean, can you see if things do get bad, uh, the, the regulators doing something similar to what they've done in New Zealand, the LVR ratios um, uh, being, being lifted? Well, I think there's a number of things that will be contemplated over that period of time. It was only in, in February, I think, when we were last talking, we were forecasting a 6 or 7% rise in, in house prices. And, of course, a lot of things have changed over the last few months. At the moment, there's very little supply of houses that are coming onto the market for sale. We're seeing uh, listings, uh, forward listings, uh, well down. So I don't think there'll be a lot of... Uh, downward pressure on house prices in the very near term, but certainly if we take a multiple year uh, forecast, mm. it's really going to depend on how effectively the economy restarts, how well the unemployment rate is managed and, and ultimately how, how confident people are about the future as well as uh, population growth, which of course is going to slow given the lack Indeed. of immigration and our borders being closed. Indeed. Now I see S&P Global Ratings expects uh, a, a sharp economic contraction and that'll cause Australian bank loan losses to balloon to $29 billion next financial year. Do you agree with that? No, not specifically, I don't. I mean, we've, we've been through our own uh, modelling and as part of uh, what we announced today as part of that forward-looking provision, we do both a multiple-year bottom-up uh, looking at individual industries uh, across our housing book, individual occupation codes, different parts of uh, the economy and geographical exposure. Certainly there is a real risk of substantial uh, credit losses and a more significant uh, economic impact over multiple years. But there's also a range of different scenarios where that doesn't play out. And I think clearly the key variable at the moment is the continuing uh, very good management and suppression uh, of the virus and all of us doing what we can to limit the transmission, yeah. uh, supporting the government's plan and trying to restart uh, the economy as safely and as effectively as we can is going to be the best sort of forward indicator on trying to avoid some of those uh, more severe and ultimately, of course, very painful uh, economic cycles. Yeah, and just on that safe restart, uh, the, the recovery, as it were, 
a lot of this is based on six months of assistance. Now, just around, I think, your full, full year results in August will be, will be coming to that six months' time. Um, it can't possibly be cold turkey, can it? I mean, what are we going to do if we still find that businesses and ordinary Australians are, are needing support? Yeah, I think what we'll see between now and that period, and from our perspective, after three months, we'll be communicating with all of our customers, particularly our personal customers, and trying to get an understanding of uh, where they're up to in their own uh, situation. We would like to hope, and, and I think it's reasonable to expect that certainly some parts of the economy and some people who had been either temporarily stood down or had lost their job have been able to be uh, re-employed. Undoubtedly, there's a lot of variation and uh, a number of different scenarios could, could still play out. Mm -hmm. And with borders likely to be closed probably for the remainder, if not the entire calendar year and into 2021, then there will uh, clearly be parts of the economy, both geographically and individual industry sectors, which will be impacted beyond that six month mark, as you said. Uh, and we've just got to factor that in and from our perspective, certainly trying to work uh, very closely with our individual customers uh, to help as many of them through as we can. Yeah, the, there is speculation that uh, JobKeeper, for, perhaps for, for some businesses that seem to be doing better, might be removed ahead of the six months. Do you see any of the um, new deals that have been put in place for bank customers being removed before the end of six months? I certainly will be in touch with customers and and if it's in if they're able to then of course it's in a customer's uh, interest in, in terms of the total interest that they'd pay on a loan to restart payments as soon as uh, as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And even in the latest uh, economic or spend data which we analyse all of the debit and credit spend that goes through the Commonwealth Bank and all of our terminals, you know, we've seen it quite an uptick in, in spend just last week and uh, up significantly from where it was in, in mid-April. There's certainly some sectors of the economy that are uh, are doing okay at the moment. Obviously, that's limited, but as we see more of those start to uh, to come online as uh, we're able to restart parts of the economy safely, then yep. that's going to start re-employing people and hopefully some of those customers who've needed that uh, temporary assistance and deferral will be in a position to uh, restart their repayments. And so it's not going to be the same for, for all customers. And so it is going to require some tailored solutions. Matt, you've been working the midnight oil. Uh, you've got this deal done uh, to sell 55% of, uh, of Colonial First State to KKR. What's that going to do for your capital management? Well, as we called out today, it will, when the deal completes, which will be in the first half of next uh, calendar year, it will contribute uh, significantly to our common equity tier one or the, the way we measure our capital, so up by between 30 and 40 basis points. So we have both the combination of a business that can generate organic capital and then, of course, we've got some uh, divestments, another one which we announced today, which is going to help uh, us to bolster our uh, common equity tier one or capital ratio. Mm. Finally, um, the dividend, uh, you chose to pay an interim dividend, of course. How, you, how do you see the potential uh, for CBA to pay uh, a, a full final dividend, um, given the expectation that some of these interim dividends that have been deferred by some of your competitors look like they may well not be paid at all? Well, a as we just discussed, a lot's changed in the last few months, and uh, I, I dare say there'll be a lot of changes between now and August. August is the time when we'd be announcing our full year results. And yeah. of course, we'll be having discussions with the board before then, but that's specifically when we, when the board would consider what the appropriate uh, decision is. And we paid uh, approximately 10% of all dividends in Australia uh, last calendar year. Uh, and so we're, we're acutely aware of uh, our, our retail shareholders in particular expectations, and we've got to balance that to, to reach the best overall decision.